had a, a, a misprint in our bulletin on today's message is entitled, What Master Are We Serving? And our text is Matthew chapter 6, verses 15 through 24. So I want to encourage you to open your pew Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6, verses 15 through 24. Let's look at God's Word together. This is the famous uh, Sermon on the Mount that we start with. So let's take a look at what Jesus has to say for us in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says these words for us. Matthew chapter 6, verses 15 through 24. I'll let you find it. I hear hear the pages going. (laughs) Okay. He says this, But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show people they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to people that you are fasting but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, There your heart will be also. The eye of the lamp, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let's bow together. Lord Jesus, as we look at this passage, help us to see and to be reminded of your call in our lives. Help us to see what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. To love you above all else. And Lord, I pray in this time that we would be encouraged to put you first and to seek you. Especially in a culture that appears to be as devoid of you as it possibly can. So, Lord, please lead us in this passage. Please lead us to discern your word. And, Lord, let us be encouraged in who you are and how you are at work in us. In your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. The first two passages here, Matthew chapter 6, are about forgiveness. It talks about the importance of forgiveness. We've talked about this here before. We're called to live as a people who live aware of all we've been forgiven for. And that seems hard, doesn't it? To live being aware of all that we've been forgiven for. Uh, Matthew chapter 18 tells a great story. Jesus tells us about a servant who owed his master more than um, 10,000 talents. A sum that he could never repay. Matthew 18. This huge sum that he could never repay, and, the, and the, the master goes to him and says, you owe me the money, it's due now. He says, I can't repay you, please give me mercy. The master says, I will forgive your debt in full. Go and be free. And the man goes out and finds a fellow servant who owes him a hundred denarii, just a little bit of money, and says, pay me what you owe me. And the, and the, other, and the fellow servant says, I can't pay you, please show me mercy. And the man who had been forgiven the great sum says no and has his fellow servant thrown in jail. And the master finds out and tells that first servant that now his sum is due. 
And we can choose to live aware of all we've been forgiven of or not. And I think even in the Christian world, oftentimes we choose not to. Because we hold on to grudges. That one person hurt me that one time, and I'm never going to forget it. We know people like that. Even in the church. And we're told here, the Sermon on the Mount's a great set of teachings by our Lord. We're told that we are to live aware of all that we've been forgiven for, for by God, and then we extend the same grace to others. It's a matter of the heart. And those followers of Christ that can walk this out in their lives are truly people that live in freedom. Because when we are in bondage, in unforgiveness, when we're in bondage, it actually greatly affects our lives. I have met so many Christians who become bitter, or angry, or mad, or mean-spirited, because they're holding on to things they cannot control. So we've been given a gift by God in the form of forgiveness, and we're called to use it. When I was going to seminary many years ago now, I was told that a good preacher is to hold the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. You know, we're to be relevant in the culture. And there has been some happenings in the news that led me back to this scripture this morning. And I don't know if many of you follow the sports world. I know Bruce certainly does um, with the, our, our, the Clippers in Los Angeles who won their game seven last night. Where most of us are excited. Okay, yeah, hey, all right, look at this. We're a, we're a sports-loving church after all. Who knew? But there, a big news came out um, where the owner of the Clippers, the longest tenured owner who'd owned the team since 1981, um, came out with some very racist comments in private that became public. He had a personal assistant or a girlfriend or somewhere in between, and, um, and she recorded, what? Yeah right, yeah, right, his right arm hand woman. Yeah, if you've seen the, the, the interview, it's, it's interesting. But he recorded sentiments that were very racist and very hurtful in private, not knowing he was being recorded, and those were leaked into the public. Um, he, he confessed and owned that it was him. Um, and it was very hurtful to a lot of people because this is a man who represents a league and it's very, um, you know, it's, it's very, um, well, I'm looking for the right word for this, yeah, well, there are black people in the league, right, but I'm talking more about equality is an important deal, not just that there are black people in the, in the, in the league. Um, and he really, this is a man who seemed like he was against all minorities in some form or another. Um, and the league uh, met, the, the commissioner met, decided to ban him for life and fine him the maximum amount of money, $2.5 million dollars and then is going to all the league owners to have him ousted. If three-fourths of the owners vote to have him ousted, he has to sell, and he's gone from the league, which people think will happen. And so as this comes out, they've started to investigate him more, and they found this is a man with a track record of, of, of really radical racism. He has more than 116 properties in Los Angeles, and he's been sued multiple times and paid out multiple settlements, settlements for being racist in his practices. And you look at this man who you'd think would have everything. I mean, he's worth more than $2 billion. Anyone want to be worth more than $2 billion? Tanya, by the way, is a big fan of Donald Sterling. We've talked about him before. She's a big fan. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Well, and it brought me back to this passage because, you know, you look at the hurtfulness of what came out of this. You know, I think most of us think that we live in a time where that is really in the past. People being hated or discriminated against because of the color of their skin or where they were born. But yet we're reminded that still does exist in some capacities in some parts of our culture, some more than others. But you look at the hurtfulness of it, and you, you find a person really who put his faith and his stock and his focus on money. 
I mean, clearly, from all outward appearances, this is a man who has committed his life to building his wealth and building his empire at the cost of people, really, who are mistreated, poorly treated, unfairly treated, discriminated against. And it makes us stop and think about, I think, ourselves. We're all given something. Here's a man who was given a lot of intelligence, a lot of ability, a lot of success in his law practice and his investments. He bought the team for $12.1 million in 1981. Now it's probably worth somewhere around $600 million. He'll probably sell it for a billion dollars if forced to sell. And you think this is a person who's got all this great stuff, and yet on the inside he seems very delusional. Even to the point of thinking of himself kind of as God, the one who provides, the one who's in control, the one who makes the games happen. And I think that when we begin to make something our God other than God is where we get into a lot of trouble. And I cannot see a better illustration of this than in this Donald Sterling story. And a very sad story to me for the people who have been hurt and also for the man himself. Very sad that you can have so much success and so much blessing, yet at the end of the day be so miserable and hurt. And I think that we see that in a situation where one's material possessions really become their God. When we're living for the stuff, when we're living for something other than God, we're living for power, for the accumulation of this world's goods, even when we get those goods, we're not guaranteed success. In fact, oftentimes, it's the exact opposite. Where we invest ourselves reflects our heart. Now, I can't claim to know the ins and outs of the minds of Donald Sterling, nor should I try to. But I think that for all of us, it causes us to look at life. You know, we're told after death that we all go to heaven and we all worship Jesus together. That's all we do. We live in paradise with God the Father. We worship Him, we praise Him, we sing with the angels. Every day is better than our best day on earth times infinity. There's no sickness, there's no death, there's no hurting, there's no pain, there's no relational drama. It's just paradise. And all we do is worship God in the presence and are filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit all day, every day, 24-7. I can't wait. But before we get there, we have this life. And it's important that we understand that this life is over fast. But we can decide what we do with this life, and it has eternal consequence. I mean, you think about someone who's made $2 million over their lifetime. They could have done some extraordinary things to help people in incredible ways. And instead, all there are is a list of testimonies of how he's offended and wronged people. That is sad. And we're all given opportunities. Maybe it's not money. Maybe it's our time. Maybe it's our energies. Maybe we're given the opportunity to say to somebody, you know what, no matter what you already believe, God loves you. That can have a lot of, of, of impact on people's lives. The Word tells us that it's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. And, and we can have an incredible impact if we understand how precious this life really is when it comes to advancing the kingdom of God. We also see it in the material world as well. Most believe that we can divide life into two categories, the spiritual and the material. Yet the Lord says in this passage, in actuality, it's our attitude toward the material that is the mark of true spirituality. So that again, our attitude towards the material is the mark of true spirituality. He says in Matthew 6.21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Talk is cheap, is what he's saying. And I know a lot of folks who talk a good game. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus 
Jesus looks, Jesus can look at our checkbook over the last 30 days and tell, and we can, and that will reflect where we are spiritually. What are our focuses? Where are we putting our treasure? Think about it for yourself. I've spent more money eating out in the last three days than I've, than I've spent tithing. And I don't need to do that. You know, where we invest ourselves, where we put our treasure, our focus, our time, our love, is so important. Now, I also want to say this. God does not say we are to be in poverty. I want us to get that. Mother Teresa did it, and that was great. He does not say we are to be in poverty. In fact, God provides an abundance for those that are faithful. There's nothing wrong with having this world's goods. We're just told we're not supposed to be owned by them. We're not to live for them. They are a gift to do what God has called us to do. Many faithful people who love God first have incredible wealth, and they're using it for the right reasons. 1 Timothy 6.17 says this for us. 1 Timothy 6.17, Paul says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. That's a big deal, is our hope in our wealth. If we come into a problem, do we know we have our wealth to fall back on, or God? Not to put their, not to put their hope in their wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. What do we see here? God actually wants us to be happy. He wants us to have enough. He wants us to have a life of enjoyment. Do I own my possessions or do my possessions own me? Luke 12, 15, he says this. Jesus says this. Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. But in this world, what does our life consist of primarily in the, world, in the eyes of the world? What we have. We even do it in the church. I go to these conferences, I want to announce Pastor Joe Schmo. His church is 400,000 members. Oh, then he must be good, right? And it's all, about, it's all about accumulation in this world, even oftentimes in the church. Things can be good or bad depending on how they're used. We have the example of movies. Movies can be something that, that convey a great truth. That Heaven is Frill was an incredible movie. And a great use of the medium of film. Conveying a, a, a young boy's experience of heaven and how it played out and changed the lives of all the people around him on earth. Incredible story. Powerful film. Yet movies can also be used for a lot of really depraved purposes. And we see that all the time. Sex is a gift from God. A wonderful and beautiful thing, but it can be twisted and perverted and become something that's used for sin. The internet can be a great resource. Also something that we need to make sure we're being aware of properly. Understanding that money and things can be used for good or evil is an important part of being a mature Christian. Our heart has to be in the right place. Our heart has to be in the right place. What are we storing up? Because all of us are storing up something. All of us are. What are the objects of our life's affection? The truth is people have been more people have been ruined by prosperity than ruined by poverty, and we see that oftentimes. More people have been ruined by prosperity than by poverty in the church. The church has always had more success with the poor than the rich who feel that they don't need God. My, I had a friend who told the story of a, of a guy who came in and prayed all the time, Lord, give me, give me an increase. Give me a, a bigger job. Let me, let me really get a, an increase and, and, and have this promotion and make all this more money and, and it's going to be good to glorify you. And he came to church every Sunday and finally he got the promotion and the bigger job and he was gone. The 
You know, we, we see it oftentimes to people come in when there's a time of great need. But when there's no need, they don't come. And some say, well, how come I'm always in need with the Lord? I think he loves some folks too much to leave them alone. If the only way they come to him is when there's need. Dr. John Maxwell is a, is a great author, and he um, pastored a church in California for a while, and he talked about a man who came to him with a great financial problem. This, this man in his church came to him, he was an executive, and he said, he said, Pastor, I used to make 200 bucks a week, and I tithed my 20 bucks faithfully. But now, today, I make 10 times that much money. I'm having trouble turning loose my $200 tithe, he said. It doesn't seem fair when most don't have to give nearly that much every week. What can I do, Pastor? Maxwell pulled him aside, and they, they, took, they went to their knees, and they, they came before God. He said, let's pray about it. And he prayed with the man. Lord, my brother here is having trouble obeying you. His problem started when you began blessing him so much financially. Lord, I pray you'll bring circumstances into his life that will reduce his salary dramatically back to where it used to be so that he can once again walk in faithfulness with you. The man jumped up and said, No, no, I can tithe! Jesus! Again, the Lord is always, always concerned with our hearts. He's always concerned with our hearts. It's not that he actually needs our money, but he desires our faithfulness. He desires our reliance. He desires that our hope, our trust, is in him and him alone. And as we're able to do that, I do believe that God provides an abundance beyond what we can imagine. This word here in verse 24, serve, to means, means literally to be captivated by something. In verse 24 it says you, you, can, you can serve only one master. This word serve literally means to be captivated by something. We're all captivated by something. Some even feel like they're their own boss, but they belong to someone, somewhere. There was a man um, in Chicago wearing a sandwich board on the front which read, it said, I am a fool for Christ. And people walked by him and laughed, and they looked at the back side of the sign, and it said, whose fool are you on the back? There was a farmer who had two calves, I like this one. One solid and one spotted. He told his wife that he felt led to raise them and to give um, the profit from one of them completely to God. I'm going to give the profit from one of the cows completely to God. Everything I make, completely to God. And she said, which, which calf? He said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to give half of one to God. A few days later, he came in and said, honey, the Lord's calf died. When times get tough, oftentimes the Lord is the first one tossed out of the mix. These are good stories, right? It's fun. We have Lot. Remember Lot and Abraham? They're going together. They've got two herds, and their 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 workers are fighting over whose grass is what. And so Abraham and Lot come together, and Abraham says, "Lot, where do you want to go?" And he says, "I want to go over to the fertile land of Sodom and Gomorrah, the best grassland around." And and Abraham blesses him, and he goes. He asks the place. He asks the question. Where's a good place to raise cattle? When he really should have been asking the question, where's the best place to raise my kids? Because he walked into Sodom and Gomorrah, a, a rich man, and left in poverty. It's vital to ask and say, who is the master that I'm serving? Who is on the throne of my life? What, what is... What is my goal with what I'm doing? And I think so much more even as a pastor, as a husband, as a son, as a father, if I say, Lord, who am I serving? Who is the one that at the end of the day is going to be glorified and magnified by what I do, by how I live, by the decisions that I make? As long as I know that it's Him, I know that things are going to go well even if they don't make sense in the eyes of the world. 
And that's, that's a hard reality for some of us. As, as we stand in this church, as we have programs, as we take stances that we're, that we're asked to take, if God is ultimately always the one who's on the throne, the one who is worshipped, the one who is loved, the one who is magnified, the one who is, is, is given the place of first, if we can walk that way, we're going to have great success. Even if we can't yet see it. And I want to encourage us in that today. So many of us are already doing it. And so my word to you is keep on keeping on. Because even if we can't yet see it, we can trust that God will provide when that's our heart. Let's pray together. So Lord, this morning we asked the question, who is on the throne? Who is first? Who is Savior in my life? Am I Savior for myself or are you, Jesus? Am I the one in charge of this church or are you? Are you the one who's glorified and magnified? Are you the one who's moving in power and love? Are you the one who we are desperate to be with? Desperate to know more about? Desperate to experience in all your power and all your glory? Lord, for each of us, may that answer be yes. And if we have not yet said to you, I want you as my Savior, I want to live my life for you and not for myself, may our prayer be that prayer this morning. Be the Savior of my life, Lord Jesus. I want to know you in your word, in prayer, in Bible study, in fellowship. I want you to be seen as my first priority in my time, in my checkbook, in my heart, in my priorities of my life. Not serving for glory, but serving out of love. And so Lord, as we look at a sad reality in our culture today, may it lead us to a great realization if what we have as a possibility, Lord, we have a great opportunity to love and bless others and share your goodness, your gospel with them. May you be glorified in and through us as we make the most of every opportunity. Be glorified in us. Be first in our priorities. Be first in our lives. We pray. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, amen. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. And thank you.